guys, thank you so much for joining me again for another video. Today I'm going to be touching on pacemakers. The bulk of this video will be specifically on the temporary pacemaker um, epicardial pacing wires. This is because I'm a CVIC nurse and most of my patients are open heart patients and they always come out with um, epicardial wires on the anterior portion of their chest. So it was really important in my practice to learn how to navigate the pulse generator, which is the external portion of the pacemaker, and to understand what's going on with the rhythm and when I need to troubleshoot it. So here to my right, probably looking at your left, is a summary of what I'm going over. Hopefully you guys will stay tuned. This, this information will be given in a format of a PowerPoint voiceover. I thought it was much easier to show you because I'm not about to be writing strips and trying to draw that and confusing you guys even more. So hopefully you stay tuned for the whole video. As always, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you have any questions or any information you want to give me, just put it down below in the comments. Welcome guys, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have fun learning pacemakers because that's what we're here to talk about. The bulk of this video is going to specifically about be about epicardial pacing and the modes and the codes and the oh no's that come with that. Because I am a CVICU nurse, that's what I deal with on a high, high population. So let's get started. <laughs> So what I have in front of you are the types of pacemakers. The first one that I'm going to talk to you about is transcutaneous pacing, and that's going to be an external version of pacing. Then you have your epicardial wires that lay on the outer portion of the heart. You have the endocardial wires, also known as the transvenous wires, and they are lying on the inner portion of the heart. You also have the option of having a permanent pacemaker, and this is for a chronic um, bradycardia or a chronic third hard block, heart block or a second degree heart block that's pretty advanced. I won't go in specifically uh, about the permanent pacemaker. I can make another video about this. But these are the types of pacemakers that you can have. So you're looking at transcutaneous pacing. And what this does is it accomplishes uh, pacing by delivering pulses of electric currents through the patient's chest which stimulates the heart to contract. So you have these outer portions uh, of the electrodes and these are gonna be on your uh, chest wall, either anterior and lateral or anterior and posterior and they're just pads that lay there. And your uh, physician might suggest you put them or place them a certain way or the uh, instructions may tell you to place them a different way. So the epicardial pacing is gonna be the wires that exit anterior of the chest. A high population of patients who get this are open heart surgery post-op patients and they get it because after having open heart surgery your uh, heart is very inflamed and you are at a high risk of having a bradycardia rhythm um, or a uh, arrhythmia that may cause your heart to slow down. You have right-sided uh, wires and this is going to be on your atrium and then you have left-sided wires that are on your ventricle. This, this is a, a dual chamber, meaning there's two, two connections, and then you have a pulse generator that will sit on the outside portion of the person. So these pacing wires will be connected to a hard pacing uh, generator that I'll show you later. The next one we have is the transvenous or endocardial pa pacing, and this goes through a larger uh, vein, either the subclavian vein or the uh, right IJ. And this can either go through the right atrium, the right ventricle, or both. In my hospital setting, these are typically laying in the ventricle. And a lot of these patients have hard time capturing because they're positional. So they're, this is such a temporary service that you want to make sure that you are positioning the patient to get the best capture. And they will eventually get a, a permanent pacemaker if they need it. The next one is the permanent pacemaker, which is internal. 
It's surgically placed and also fed through the same vein that the transvenous pacemaker is fed through. And um, there are tons of restrictions post-op. And you want to make sure you're educating your patients of the do's and don'ts that they need to do or don't do after having this place. Uh-oh. Now it's time for the nitty gritty, the epicardial pacing wires. The pacemaker uh, has positions on the pulse generator. This is going to tell you how you control the heart's rhythm, okay? So the first position on that epicardial uh, pacing is going to be what is being paced. And that can be either your ventricle, your atrium, or both, which will be B for dual or O for off. So you can either have a V, an A, or a D. The second position would be what's being sensed. And it will be the same options as above, but it will just go off of what, what are we sensing? Are we sensing the atrium or are we sensing the ventricle? The third position is the response to sensing, and it can either inhibit, it can keep from get, uh, administering a shock, or it can be both inhibit and trigger, it's triggering a shock, or hold, withholding a shock, or it can be O for off. There is a fourth and a fifth position. In the fourth position, you often see patients with heart dysfunction and their cardiac stimulation um, intrinsically doesn't work effectively. And what this means is with exercise or with effort, their heart rate does not increase as it should. It, it just stays the same. And so with the pacemaker in uh, the fourth position, you can turn R on for rate modulation. And um, there is a sensor that will allow the increase in cardiac stimulation and the increase in the, um, the heart, the rate, whenever the patient needs it, whether they're walking up the steps or if they're taking a jog, anything that should increase the heart rate uh, with, ex with any kind of exertion, that's what that's used for. And then the fifth position we don't often use, so I really won't cover it. So this mode is referred to as asynchronous pacing, maybe meaning I'm not synchronizing with the rhythm. It's not being sensed. So this is a example of when sensing and response to sensing are both turned off. And then you just have the first chamber filled out. And the V would be for ventricle, the A would be for atrium, and the D would be for both dual, atrial, and uh, ventricular. So this is like a fixed rate, basically. So whatever your first chamber is, that's telling you what's being paced, right? So you are going to have a set rate for whatever is being paced. So in this uh, picture, you have VOO, which means the ventricle is being paced to a set rate, let's say 60. And every 60 beats or every whatever milliseconds, there is going to be a spiker that a spike that forms and this can fall outside of where it needs to it can be in a P wave and a T wave and that's why you see that it's not capturing well because it's not sensing your intrinsic beat that's why this can sometimes be dangerous and it's not really a favorite but um, if you have a, a very low underlying heart rhythm you usually don't run into problems but it's when you're you're you can't there's not a fixed rate and you can't tell what your patient's intrinsic beat is, it might start falling on the wrong parts and that can be very harmful. Um, this is when we're going to be pacing and sensing in the same compartment. So your, your first two chambers will be the same letter and then you will have inhibiting, uh, you'll have it inhibiting at the end. So that's the third chamber. So for example, in this picture you have AAI mode. And it's sensing the heart intrinsic activity and uh, inhibits or withholds the electric impulse when pacing is unnecessary. So the atrium is being paced and the atrium is being sensed. And it's going to inhibit when the atrium is sensed and the P wave has, has popped up when it needs to. So you see for the first two uh, rhythms, the first two uh, complexes, you have a P wave, a QRS, and then a T. And then you have a P wave, a QRS, and a T. And then you have a pacer spike on that P wave because whatever the set rate was, there was not a P wave that popped up within that set rate. So the spike decided to send an electrical impulse and start that P wave, and then you have a QRS to follow. The same thing happened again. 
and the same thing happened again. And then your intrinsic beat came before that time after that, and you see the P in the QRS and then another P in the QRS. So if your intrinsic beat is faster than what the rate setting is, you won't see a pacer spike. But if the intrinsic beat is lower, you'll see a pacer spike on whatever is being uh, paced. So whether that's the ventricle, it would be a QRS. If it's the atrium, it would be a P wave. And if it's a D for dual, it will be both um, the atrium and the ventricle, which would be a P wave and a QRS. And DDI, which is dual on both of them, uh, the mode, uh, this mode, the pacemaker is functioning as both AAI and VVI together, but they also are independent. So you can have an AAI spike, but not a VVI um, if your intrinsic QRS comes before the AV delay. What's an AV delay, Brie? I don't understand. An AV delay means that a P wave has popped up, and then there's a set timing to when that QRS should come. And so if the QRS comes, um, before it should, then you won't see a pacer spike on that QRS. But if it doesn't come according to the P wave, then there will be a spike with the QRS. And this is just trying to uh, maintain AV synchrony to make sure that you're, there is al always a P wave with your QRS. Um, this is a little bit more like an intrinsic beat. It becomes more adjustable than just a VOO or a AOO or AAI, um, and it has dual chambers where it both acts on the ventricle and the atrium independently but also dependently. Here is an example of DDI, and so that again is going to be dual atrial and ventricle pace, and dual atrial and ventricle pace, and then it's going to inhibit. So um, the first complex that you see on the top strip, you have a P wave that was um, was spiked and you have a QRS that was spiked. Um, after that, you have another P wave that was spiked and another QRS that was spiked. After that, you then see that the P wave was not spiked. And that's because from the time of the last P wave to that P wave, the intrinsic beat came before the set rate. But that T wave is going to now go off of the last T wave. Um, because there is no AV delay. You cannot have an AV delay if the pacer uh, did not spike on the P wave. So that's what I mean by they're independent, but they're dependent. Um, they can be dependent with an AV delay if the P wave spikes and then the QRS goes after that. Um, it's dependent on the atrium, but if the atrium is not spiked and its intrinsic beat is faster, the ventricle rate is going to go off of the last ventricle rate. You see that on the lower lower side. You see that um, the A was sensed and the QRS was paced. So here are your dual tracking modes. Your dual tracking modes means everything is tracking both, I mean it's sensing both the QRS and it's responding both to the QRS. The only difference in these is only the ventricle is being paced in the lower one, the VDD. And in the top, the DDD, everything is being paced, everything is being sensed, and everything is being responded to with that sense, which means everything's being paced. So um, in the VDD, this mode maintains AV, AV synchrony the best without pacing the atrial. But if the atrial rate drops lower than the pacing limit, the AV synchrony is lost. So what that means is that because there is no atrium uh, pacing, that there is no impulse going to the atrium, so you lose the AV synchronicity. Yes, you are sensing the atrium, but you are not pacing the atrium, so it's impossible to keep an AV delay. And again, what is the AV delay? It means that the atrium is either paced, and then from that paced atrium, there is a set timer to when the ventricle should go. But because the atrium is not being paced, you lose that synchrony um, with VDD. As you look on the screen, you see DDD, 
D, D, D. I feel like I said it 10 times. D, D, D mode. And so that's showing you that it's spiking on either the P wave or the QRS or both. It just depends on what it's sensing and how it's sensing. So the first complex has a, a intrinsic P wave QRS. The second complex has a paste P wave and then an intrinsic QRS because the QRS came before the set rate whenever the QRS was supposed to uh, spike, it came before that. And then the next one you see a paste P wave and a paste, uh, also a paste QRS. Um, you will notice that the QRS complexes are wider when they're paste and that's just because of the impulse. Um, that's gonna always, the QRS will always be wider when it's paste than the, the intrinsic um, beat. So you also see that there are let's see, three consecutive, no, there's two consecutive P wave and QRS complex that are paced. And then you have a P wave that comes on its own and then a QRS spikes. So again, you are pacing both Q, the P wave and the QRS, the atrium and the ventricle. You are sensing both of them and you're also responding to both of them. So it's, it's clear around the board and DDD, everything is reacting. So capturing is the contraction of the myocardium and is evidenced by the presence of the electrical impulse um, marked by the spike on the EKG. Failure to capture means that the um, heart failed to respond to the pacemaker's impulse. You want to make sure you're having a hundred percent capture on your um, strips. So as you see in this strip, there's a couple pacer spikes that don't have a complex to follow them, and that's a lack of capture. So what you want to do is decrease your capture all the way until when you lose capture and you see these spikes, and then you want to increase it to two to three times more than when you lose the capture. So capture is measured by milliamps, and that's an MA, and you can see that later on the pulse generator. When you turn on the pulse generator, your um, settings automatically set to default at 10 MAs. So just know your capturing is automatic, automatically going to be set to 10 MAs for both your ventricle and atrium. Um, again, failure to capture is when the spikes come at the right time, but there is not an appropriate response to them. So that means there's this pacer spike, but there is not a P wave or Q QRS that follows the pacer spike. In contrast, failure to sense is when the pacer spikes come at the wrong time, but there is a response. There is a waveform that follows the pacer spike. Sensitivity is controlled by the millivolts. That is the MVs. They're going to be lower on the pulse generator. And so you want to think of your MVs like a fence. And if you can't see on top of your fence, your fence is too high, you need to turn your fence down so that you can see what you need to sense. So if you're trying to sense a P wave, and it's set too high, it's going to spike on a, T, a QRS wave because it, that's the only thing you can see. So you just want to make sure that you are monitoring your MVs if your pacer spikes are forming a response, but they're forming a response in the wrong place. Here is an example of the external pulse generator that I've been talking about. And at the top, you can see the power button. And then you start to see rate settings. That first number 80 is going to be the rate that you set the next 10 and 10, that's going to be the MAs, which are the capture. Below that, you're going to see the mode is DDD. So that's going to be dual all across the board. And then you have a battery. And then you have a lock key, which is the green key to the right. And then at the bottom, you have choices to pick from. Your different modes, you're going to also see your sensitivity there. Here's a closer look at that pulse generator again. At the top, you see the 80, and then you see where it says MAs, and it says atrial output or ventricle output, so you see that that's the capturing for both the atrium and the ventricle. And then to the right, you see the sensitivity is at the top of that screen, and then you see other things, such as the AV interval, which can be looked at as the AV delay. At the very bottom, you see the atrium input and the ventricle input that you connect to the pacer wires. Um, to control the electrical impulses through your patient. All right, guys, we finally made it to the end of this video. I'm sorry it was kind of lengthy. I just want to say thank you for learning. You are great. And so, as always, special thank you to each one of you guys who stuck around for the whole video, and I hope you learned so much 
Please leave me any questions in the comment section. Do not forget to share with the buddy if this was helpful to you. I struggled on pacemakers um, coming out as a new grad. So if you're a nursing student or a new grad, thank you.